Well, um, I don't want to overpromise on that title. It's a little bit provocative. Um, I'm not going to give any juicy uh, local politics here. Uh, this po the, the political ecology in the title of the talk, thank you, um, it really refers more to both a formalized academic discipline and a way of thinking about science and about politics more than any specifics that I'm going to get into. I'm not going to step into that quagmire of talking about political specifics. But I do want to talk about forest health, which does encompass um, lots of things in the forest. And I'm going to focus specifically on non-native insect and, and pathogen problems um, as they relate to California forest as a whole. And I'm hoping that I can bring it around to make its relevance to the Redwood region a little bit clearer by the end of the talk. And uh, also keep in mind, these, these are things that all of you, I think, probably already know. I'm just trying to jog your, your thought processes a little bit and have a step outside of science and, and think about it in a critical way. Um, let's start by looking at this picture here. You know, those of you who work in this region and, and even over the past few days of this conference probably have an idea of what we're looking at. So I'm going to give you a little quiz. Um, what are we looking at in this picture? Eucalyptus. It looks like it's about to eat those foolhardy folks sitting there in the cut. Any, any other guesses? You're all far too cautious. It's a trick question. Okay, the, the, it is a trick question. Of course, the credits will make it a little clearer. Photo courtesy American Chestnut Foundation. So this is an American chestnut from the eastern U.S. And um, what I'm hoping is that by the end of the talk, it will become a little more obvious why I bring uh, American Chestnut up. I mean, everybody's familiar with American Chestnut and the Chestnut Blight. So kind of keep that in mind. Um, so to start with here, I want to give an example of a current problem that a non-native insect, a non-native invasive insect, is causing for California forests. Um, this is, these are some examples of damage in Southern California to hardwood trees caused by these two insects, the polyphagus shot hole borer and the corrosio shot hole borer. Um, this will set the stage for, for our conversation. Uh, these two insects uh, are very difficult to distinguish from each other. And in fact, they are very difficult to distinguish from a third better known species that they were mistaken for when they first appeared in California. But it has, you know, using the genetics, they figured out that they are two distinct species. It's still not entirely clear where exactly they came from, but it's probably somewhere in Southeast Asia. These are two beetles that um, are smaller than a penny. They are what we call ambrosia beetles, which means that they move into trees um, in great numbers, as you can see. They tunnel in. They bring fungi into the trees for the developing larvae to eat as they grow up. And as they bring these fungi in, the fungi uh, end up helping them kill the tree. Most ambrosia beetles move into trees that are already stressed by some environmental factor. But since these didn't come from Southern California, and they didn't co-evolve with these trees, they don't necessarily require that stress factor to attack the trees. They just have found some good food. Um, a lot of different hardwood hosts that they've been found in, some of them they can complete their reproductive cycle in those trees, and some they can't. They are working right now, these beetles, on denuding the Tijuana River Valley of almost all of its willow trees. Over a million willow trees are estimated to have been killed so far. And there's no reason why these shot hole borers can't move farther north through the rest of the state and do their work on hardwood trees in other parts of the state. Now, in introducing an example of what these non-native insects can do, I really don't want to minimize how important native pests can be. So just as a side note, here's a picture of current damage caused by native pests. From horizon to horizon in the southern Sierra, you can see extensive mortality of conifers caused by a complex of factors, drought stress, root disease, and most evidently our native bark beetles. Um, and this is an indication when native pests cause this kind of damage that the environmental conditions are out of whack in some way. Um, as we know in California for 
many years now. There are lots of important native pests in the redwood region also. And it's important to note that often in cases like this, with native pest attacks, there's not much that can be done except to cope with the impacts. Hopefully, with, the, with most non-native insect and disease problems, there is something that you can do or the damage can be preventable. Non-native insects and pathogens have a, a litany of, of problems that they cause to our wildlands. They change the way that the forests look. This is an example of a sudden oak death killed pin oak. Um, they change ecosystem functions. They can increase fire hazards. Very importantly, they impact cultural resources, trees that are important to specific groups of people that have used those trees and depended on those trees for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. Um, they affect food and habitat for wildlife. Um, they can affect water quality. And very important to a lot of people, when these insects and pathogens show up, mitigations and quarantines are imposed. Regulations are imposed. It's harder to move products from one place to another out of the forest um, to, to a non-quarantined area or a non-regulated area. And, um, and regulations tend to proliferate and spring up. So how is the damage from non-native insects and pathogens preventable? Well, this is one way. This is a, a, these, these two pictures are examples of a, a border station inspection regime. And this happens both at California state boundaries, but also at national boundaries. So the picture on the left is one of our California agriculture border inspection stations. This is the one on Highway 15 between uh, the LA area and Las Vegas. The picture on the right is a couple of agents, inspection agents for the USDA APHIS, the Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, and they're looking at these plants to see if they can detect any pathogens or pests that a closer look will reveal. The picture on the left of the, of the border inspection station uh, is interesting. I got this picture from uh, an online article that first showed up in the Las Vegas Review Journal, and it was kind of amusing because the context for that article was, look at this border station on Highway 15, Traffic backs up constantly behind it, and it keeps people from getting to Las Vegas. So the mayor and these other politicians in Las Vegas were saying, we don't see what it's for. We think it should just get removed. Why don't they just tear down the border station? Which gives you a little window into the mind of people who are strictly solely focused on economic development, especially when, when you're talking about um, people who are not from the state that it's uh, benefiting. So we do have these border inspection stations and, and inspectors at our ports of entry. Uh, the story of non-native pests is really closely intertwined with economics, as you started to see from those pictures. But this paper, which showed up in 2012 um, in Frontiers in Ecology and the, and the Environment, it made it very clear that one of the main ways non-native insects and pathogens get into the country is on live plants that are imported into the country. Um, you can see there are these different groups of pests, sap feeders, foliage feeders, and pathogens. Their main way of getting into the country has been traced back to live plants that were brought in. Um, the other major pathway seems to be wood products, and most of these are incidental wood products, especially packing materials, pallets and things like that, boxes, et cetera. And um, that's how most of our invasive non-native beetles seem to have gotten in. Very big pathway. From that same paper, we can see that over the past 50 years or, or so, the uh, number of live plants that have been brought in has been climbing. And also, we export more than we used to, but that hasn't been climbing nearly as sharply as uh, the, the live plants. Um, and their value has sharply increased. There is a little dip at the end of the graph, which you'll see coincides roughly with the recession years. So that's when those imports fell off a little bit. Um, this graph ends in 2009, but I suspect that it sort of has leveled off, if not gone up again. So the economic story is pretty clearly shown. Live plants are of great value to many uh, industries and businesses. So really, pest exclusion or 
heading pests off at the port it is a common sense step that we can see we need to take to protect forests. It's not always as easy for other people involved in other sectors that are unrelated to forestry or tangentially related to forestry to understand that. But it seems like we do have an inspection regime. We do have a border station regime. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the system, the border inspection system and the plant inspection system has gradually been weakened just as the major import pathways for live plants have opened up wider and wider. And to really understand that, we have to get into a little bit of history. So what you see on the left here is a pathogen called white pine blister rust, which is non-native and invasive. It showed up in the U.S. once on the East Coast, and once on the West Coast, within a few years of each other, independent introductions and it was early in the 20th century. So it was actually about the same time that chestnut blight was taken off. Um, and the appearance of white pine blister rust, which kills five needle pine species, most all kinds, eastern white pine, western white pine, sugar pine, white bark pine, all of those things, this appearance stimulated legislators to really think about how to tackle this problem. They were aware of the problem of non-native invasive species coming in, and especially on live ornamental plants. And so they took a two-pronged approach over the century after that. The first is the one that you see on the right, which was a post-establishment pathogen management effort. And it was a huge effort. What this consisted of, and what the guy here is doing, is finding all of the alternate hosts for this rust fungus which all fall into the, uh, the genus Ribes, and trying to pull them. They did this both in the western U.S. and in the eastern U.S. And it's interesting, the Ribes eradication effort, it went on for decade after decade after decade. And it was, it was like a, you know, a, a WPA scale effort. And um, even after it looked like in some places, this wasn't really going to work. The inertia, momentum, and funding were on their side, so they kept it going for decades upon decades. In the West, it basically didn't work. In the East, in certain spots, it did work. And the, part of the difference there was that the West is just too rugged to find all the ribes and pull them all, whereas in the East, topography was easier to work with, and they could have a more thorough effort going on. So that's one example of dealing with these things after they already get here. The other prong of the effort, though, was something called the Plant Quarantine Act of 1912. And so they realized that something needed to be done to regulate imports of live plants. Um, the Plant Quarantine Act of 1912 basically gave the government wide latitude to reject groups of plants, to um, regulate its borders, to um, inspect things and send them back out of the country. And then the, the, the Plant Quarantine Act got modified you know, several times. It eventually got to a state where uh, about the 37th modification, they called it Quarantine 37, and it was held in force for most of the century. But as you saw in the late 60s, trade in live plants started to increase. and um, things started to change philosophically and politically, and it culminated in 1990 in the formation of the World Trade Organization. The World Trade Organization then rewrote the rule book, and it basically invalidated the Plant Quarantine Act of 1912. Um, it didn't actually formally throw it out, but it imposed a new set of agreements and regulations on top of it. And in what I say about the WTO, you got to remember that although you know, I'm, it seems like I'm pointing the WTO out as a bit of a villain, the major force behind the WTO's uh, inception and behind the shape that its agreements and regulations have taken is the United States. So whatever the WTO has brought forward has kind of come from within here. Um, in 1994, the WTO promulgated the Agreement on phyto Sanitary and Phytosanitary Standards which has basically replaced the Plant Quarantine Act, the Quarantine 37. 
And there are at least three important parts to the um, agreement on sanitary and phytosanitary standards. Number one, whenever phytosanitary disputes arise between two member states, both states have to agree on the measure. And by states, I mean nations, countries. Both have to agree on the measures that will be put in place. So what this is, is it's basically a sovereignty removing measure. Um, it, things have to be adjudicated by agreement. One country can no longer unilaterally do things. Thank you. Number two, it subjects phytosanitary measures to a formal risk assessment procedure. So this takes moral considerations out of the way. You can no longer use any kind of precautionary principle for environmental protection to justify the measure you want to put in place. And it puts the dispute into the realm of objective science. And the third important point is that the guiding principle of this agreement is the principle of non-interference with trade. This is the bedrock of the WTO, kind of like the First Amendment is for um, our system of government. Um, and so this, the, the, in, the important thing to note with the um, principle of non-interference with trade is that it is a moral, social, political, philosophical principle. It's not a scientific principle. So in a way, the WTO is disguising this value statement by putting it under a veneer of objective science. And the point of this talk is just to help us keep that in mind when we're thinking about forest health. You could select any other bedrock um, principle and put a science veneer over that. Um, for example, if it threatens biodiversity, um, it's going to be subject to some sort of risk assessment or something like that. Um, and keep in mind that I'm not arguing the rightness or wrongness of of the way this is. I'm just pointing out that we tend to overlook that this value principle underlies um, this, this reliance on science. And this is what the discipline of political ecology does. It just points this out so that we can keep it in mind. Um, for the WTO, the cardinal sin is protectionism. If the cardinal virtue is non-interference with trade, the cardinal sin is protectionism. And given that this is the case, what are those of us who are into forest health protection supposed to do? Well, one thing to do is to emphasize technical solutions to the problem after the pests get here. And I'll quickly go through some examples. This is Sudden Oak Death. These are both in Humboldt County. Um, and these are removing susceptible tree species uh, before they have a chance to relay infective, infectious inoculum to, to other uninfested trees. Um, here is an example of removal of trees. It's a very similar thing for Asian longhorn beetle in Worcester, Massachusetts, a non-native invasive beetle. You can see that this technical solution to the problem has big impacts on the people who are living in this area. Um, and gypsy moth, which is probably the best known example and the best funded example, where um, which is the gypsy moth has been here since 1869 or so. It's been slowly spreading from east to west across the country since then. At the leading edge of the gypsy moth infestation, they spray mating disruption pheromones to keep the males from finding the females and mating with them. This slows the spread considerably. Uh, gypsy moth is not going to be eradicated, as we know that uh, most of these non-native invasive pests, once they become established, it's very hard to do that. I um, mean, here are just some more examples of scientific innovations, technical solutions. This is typically the way that we approach this problem. This is our default setting for dealing with forest pests. We often don't think about the root or the fact that maybe we could have some influence over the root, which is, which is this uh, world trading system that we've got. We are learning to manage pests better than ever, but almost none of these are ever eradicated once they get here. Um, and I wanted to just show, throw a couple of headlines out just to emphasize the fact that we depend on science and technical solutions as our crutch, as our go-to, um, rather than thinking in the political realm. I mean, this one is about both sudden oak death and the tree mortality in the Sierras. And look at that underlying phrase. Scientists say that until they learn more about oak disease, so 
if we just learn more about oak disease, we'll be able to solve the problem. That's the assumption there. Um, same thing here with emerald ash borer, which is on track to kill all the ash trees in the United States until scientists find a way to defeat this insect. Maybe we will find a way to defeat this insect, um, but that doesn't change the root problem. Um, and then even when you talk about dealing with pests after they become established, this post-establishment management phase, it's subject to a variety of political considerations as well. Where does it show up? So Humboldt County, Trinity County, the red dot on the right side is into Trinity County. Um, it's shown up in one small place, but the entirety of the county is regulated for the pathogen now. So um, there, are, there are political boundaries that we decide to, re to use to regulate these pathogens and pests. These are political decisions. This doesn't have a lot to do with the, the science of the pest. Um, the time frames within which these things are managed, the territories that keep you from managing them or do not. And here's my last slide. I wanted to bring this back around to American chestnut. You know, chestnut blight showed up in the early 20th century. Within 50 years, it, it had basically wiped out chestnut as a, an overstory dominant tree species, and now it's been replaced by other species. Here are some of the silvical properties of, of American chestnut. It was dominant in its forest. It was large in stature, not very successful at reproducing from seed, even though it produces these big, beautiful, attractive seeds, they all got eaten up. So it, it didn't depend on that as its primary reproductive strategy. Um, it had an abundant a uh, re-sprouting um, strategy for that. So it fared well under, a, I should have probably written frequent fire regime. Um, fire was good for it. Um, it grew rapidly. It was an iconic tree in the east. Um, and it was, the, the, the main point I want to drive home with this is that at the turn of the 20th century, no one could have had an inkling that there was going to be a non-native pest that moved in and, and removed this as a major component of the forest. And these people in the East have lost something very valuable and irreplaceable. And I'm just wondering if American chestnut reminds you of anything. This is my attempt to bring it back to the Redwood region. Um, you know, it's, it's a good idea to at least be aware of the way that the, the, the main movers of non-native insects and pathogens work. And to be in, if we can't change the systems ourselves, because of course you think, you know, the world trading system, what can I do about it? What we can do is be in conversation with our elected representatives at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. You know, things like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, this is a key time for people to be receiving input about that. Um, and I really appreciate your time and attention in letting me take you into the, the lunch hour. Thank you.